Thank you, and thanks uh, to NATF for inviting me here, and thank you, Sam, for organizing a wonderful educational session today. You can always tell Sam's sessions from others because not only do you get a syllabus with all the slides, but you get a CD with all the slides. It's that belt and suspenders approach to education that Sam takes. Now, what I'm going to focus on today are the novel oral anticoagulants. I'm not going to talk about new parental anticoagulants. I'm not going to talk about the generic uh, low molecular weight happened because Craig Kessler is going to talk a little bit about that later. And I want to make it clear up front that these novel oral anticoagulants, although they have been introduced in Canada, uh, Europe, and many other countries for short-term prophylaxis after elective hip or knee replacement surgery, really the major reason that they were developed was as replacements for warfarin for long-term uh, anticoagulant therapy. So although they have been introduced first for these short-term indications, really the big unmet need is for more convenient long-term anticoagulation. And uh, none of the oral anticoagulants is licensed in the U.S., so what I'm going to be talking about is all off-label use, so you do not do this at home. <laughs> These are my disclosures. And briefly, I'm going to talk to you very quickly about some of the limitations of warfarin. I know that all of you in the audience are very familiar with these, so I won't spend much time on that. But I'm going to use these limitations to build on the pharmacology of the new agents and show you how these new agents will overcome most of these limitations. And then I'm going to briefly give you some highlights of the emerging role of the new agents. And I'm going to talk about the opportunities and some of the challenges for these agents as we move forward. So the limitations of warfarin, they're well known to all of you, and uh, they include this slow onset of action, which necessitates overlap with parenteral anticoagulants when we start treatment in patients with established thrombosis or at high risk for thrombosis. There are common genetic polymorphisms that affect warfarin metabolism, and this, at least in part, is reduced, is, is, explains the variable uh, dose requirements. Of course, there's multiple food and drug interactions with warfarin. Dietary vitamin K intake will affect the dosing. Drug-drug uh, interactions can result in either an increase or a decrease in the anticoagulant effect of, of warfarin. So because of these food and drug interactions, frequent uh, coagulation monitoring is needed to ensure that we have a therapeutic anticoagulant response. And this is particularly important because of the narrow therapeutic uh, index. We know that if the INR goes below 2, there's an increase in thrombotic effect, events, and as it starts going up above 4, there's an increase in, in bleeding, and of course, of course the most feared bleeding is intracranial bleeding. Now, the new oral anticoagulants, rather than being nonspecific agents that reduce levels of a whole variety of different clotting factors, the new agents are targeted therapies that target the active site of either factor 10A or thrombin, key enzymes in coagulation. Now, the agents that are in uh, most advanced development include rivaroxaban and apixaban, which target factor 10A, and dabigatranotexalate, which targets thrombin or factor 2A. These are all small molecules. As a class, the factor 10A inhibitors are active agents, whereas dabigatranotexalate is a prodrug that needs to be metabolically activated after absorption. These agents have variable bioavailabilities, but they all produce a rapid uh, onset of anticoagulation, and the time to peak levels of drug 
to peak levels of anticoagulation, that the, this time is very similar to the time uh, to peak anticoagulation that you get if you give a treatment dose of low molecular weight heparin subcutaneously. Their half-lives are such that these drugs can be given once or twice daily. And I think it's important to note that they all exhibit some degree of renal excretion. And because of this, there is the potential for accumulation in patients with uh, renal insufficiency. And the extent of this, in, uh, this accumulation will vary depending on the drug. So if we look at the features of the new agents compared with those of warfarin, we have agents that have a rapid onset of action instead of the slow uh, onset. They produce such a, uh, a predictable level of anticoagulation, and there's no food or very few drug-drug interactions that they can be given in fixed doses, and we don't have to do routine coagulation monitoring. So it's not that we may not need monitoring at some times, sometimes, but certainly routine monitoring and dose adjustments are not necessary. The half-lives of these new agents are relatively short compared to that of warfarin, but it's important to note that there are no specific antidotes for these agents. We don't have the vitamin K, the replacement with fresh frozen plasma, or the capacity to give the four-factor concentrates that we have for reversing warfarin. Now, the big question is, how do these new oral agents compare with warfarin? And we have some uh, exciting and emerging data. The RELY trial was the trial of uh, dabigatran at Texlate compared with warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation. And based on the RELY trial, the uh, FDA committee looked at uh, dabigatran at Texlate earlier this week. And uh, the, the panel was 9 to 0 in favor of approving uh, dabigatran for this indication. So this was a large trial. Uh, over 18,000 patients, and they were randomized into one of three arms. They were either given 110 or 150 milligrams of dabigatran twice daily. This uh, was a double blind to dose of dabigatran, or they were given the control, warfarin, which was dose adjusted to an INR of two to three. This was open label between warfarin and dabigatran. All outcome events were uh, adjudicated by committees that were blinded to uh, drug allocation. Now I show you the baseline characteristics just to, of the patients in these three groups just to highlight a few points. First of all, over 6,000 patients in each treatment group. So this uh, is the largest study in atrial fibrillation to date although there are ongoing studies that are going to be even larger. The mean age in the patients here is about 71 years old. The mean CHAD score, so the CHAD score, for those of you who are not familiar with this, is a score that we use to determine the risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. And the mean CHAD score was uh, just over two. And we have about a third of the patients who have CHAD score of 0 to 1, a third with a CHAD score of 2, and a third with a CHAD score of 3 or higher. About 20% of the patients had a prior stroke or transient ischemic attack, so we're looking at secondary prevention of stroke in these patients. And uh, about 50% of the patients were warfarin naive, so this means that 50% of the patients had not been on long-term warfarin be before they came into the study. The other 50% were what we could call switchers. They had been on warfarin for a variable length of time, and now they were then randomized to either continue warfarin or to go on to, to bigotran. Now, the, the, the primary efficacy endpoint was stroke or systemic embolism. And you can see 
uh, compared with warfarin, the lower dose regimen, the 110 milligram BID regimen, was non-inferior to uh, warfarin. So the non-inferior means that the upper bound of the 95% confidence interval is below the non-inferiority margin of 1.46. Some of the ongoing trials are using a more stringent non-inferiority margin of 1.38, but you can see that this upper margin is well below that as well. So a clear and very highly significant non-inferiority result with the low-dose regimen. Now the high-dose regimen, the 150 milligram BID regimen, is superior to warfarin. So not only is the 95% confidence interval below this non-inferiority line, but it also is below the line of identity between the two drugs. So here we have a clearly superior result compared with warfarin. So for the first time, we have an oral agent that can be given in fixed doses without routine monitoring that is actually superior to warfarin at reducing the risk of stroke or systemic embolism. Now the flip side of efficacy with anticoagulants and as we heard just a few minutes ago with antiplatelet agents is safety, safety in terms of bleeding. So what are the bleeding results in this study? So if we look at uh, at rates of total bleeding, in fact, total bleeding is lower with both doses of dabigatran than it is with warfarin. But let's concentrate on major bleeding. This is the more serious bleeding. And uh, the point estimates are lower with both doses of dabigatran compared with warfarin. The major bleeding rate of 2.7% with the lower dose regimen of dabigatran versus 3.4% with warfarin, that's a significant reduction. This is not significant. But with life-threatening bleeding, significantly less bleeding with both doses of uh, dabigatran compared with warfarin. An interesting observation and an unexpected one was that with the higher dose regimen, there's actually more gastrointestinal bleeding with uh, dabigatran than there is with warfarin. And this may be a, a, a feature of the formulation of dabigatran where there's tartaric acid in the capsules to, it's there to promote absorption and to maintain a, a, an acidic uh, microenvironment in the stomach. And it's possible that this tartaric acid core in the capsule is at least in part responsible for the dyspepsia, which is more common with dabigatran than it is with warfarin, and for the GI bleeding with the high dose. But serious bleeding, life-threatening bleeding, major bleeding, lower with dabigatran than with warfarin. Now, the most feared bleeding in our anticoagulated patients is intracranial hemorrhage. And rates of intracranial hemorrhage were significantly lower in the range of 60 to 70 percent with both doses of dabigatran compared with warfarin. So less intracranial hemorrhage with dabigatran than with warfarin. Now, you know, how does this happen? Because for those of us who've been involved in anticoagulation for many, many years, we know that as you push up the efficacy or the dose of your anticoagulant, you get uh, better efficacy, but you often pay a price in terms of more bleeding. So how is it possible that dabigatran, the 150 milligram dose, can be uh, better efficacy, but without an increased bleeding? And I think partly this may be the targeted inhibition of thrombin, may be better than uh, multiple targets that we have with warfarin, but probably more important is the consistent and predictable anticoagulant effect. Instead of having with warfarin when INRs go up or down or are variable, you have uh, targeted uh, anticoagulation, so you're in that sweet spot between efficacy and safety all the time instead of just hit and miss as might occur in many of our patients on warfarin.